Friends, you have heard the scripture read into your hearing. Let me read to you the thesis verse. From the Gospel of St. John in the 8th chapter, verse 7, it reads as follows. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up. And he said to them, let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Underline these words, if you would, please. Let anyone among you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Brothers and sisters, with the help of your prayers and under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, we want to preach to you briefly this morning on the subject of caught in the act, forgiven on the spot. Caught in the act, forgiven on the spot. Let's start this sermon off the right way. I'm telling you in advance, you're not going to like this sermon. I want to be clear so that when it's over, we know that we agreed at the beginning, you're not going to like what I'm about to preach. I didn't like it when I wrote it. And I certainly am not going to enjoy preaching it. We're not going to like it this morning because this is the part of our Christianity that cuts like a two-edged sword. And here it is. The thesis of the message this morning is telling you and telling me that if you would like to fill your spiritual bank account, you have to forgive other people. This particular story of the woman caught in adultery conjures up these warm and fuzzies every time we think about the story. Is not Jesus honest and caring and loving in the way that he absolves a clearly guilty person from their wrongdoing? He wipes her sin debt away. He cancels her debt and then he sends her on her way. We like this story because when we read it, we think about ourselves as the person who's been caught in sin. Every one of us in here knows that we are guilty. We make mistakes. We do things that are outside of God's will. And we love the idea of knowing that we've done something wrong, standing before Jesus and Jesus wiping our sin away telling us that we are free and sending us on our way. You and I love Jesus because we love the idea that our great Savior shall forgive our misdeeds, that our great God will love us in spite of us, and our God, like he did with this woman in the eighth chapter of John, after he had wiped her dead away, sent her back to her life. This story gives us the warm and fuzzies. It, it makes us sing, I'm free. Praise the Lord, I'm free. I was in bondage from sin. I was guilty from my mistakes. I knew that I had done wrong, but the Lord wiped my debt clean. This is why I love Jesus. And if that's the way you read the story, you are absolutely appropriate in what you are doing. There's just one problem. You see, there's multiple characters in the story. And whenever you read the Bible, it is a shallow reading of scripture if you only see yourself as one character. The reason narratives are given in scripture is that you and I are supposed to put ourselves in the position of everybody in the story because at some point in time in our lives, we've been everybody in the story. Our goal here is to play all the roles in the narrative and see how's that going to work out for you. 
So it's easy to play the role of the person who's been caught making a mistake, to have other people drag you into the town square and verbally accost you because this has happened to us. And it's easy to stand before a holy God who shall not hold you guilty for the mistakes that you have made, who absolves you of your sin and sends you on your way. Praise be to God. But that's not what I'm preaching this morning. This morning, I don't want you to see yourself as the woman caught in adultery. What if you're not the accused? But what happens when you are the accuser? What happens when you and I are the scribes and the Pharisees and we are the ones who bring forth the woman who's caught in adultery? This is about to get tight, so everybody unbuckle your belt just a little bit. Stay with me. Let me see if I can't make my point. Every now and then in our lives, you are not the one who has been caught in sin. You are the person who's accusing somebody else of their sins. Every now and then, you and I are the accuser. We are the one pointing the finger at someone who's done wrong. Every now and then, you and I metaphorically or physically drag people before Jesus. And we say, Jesus, this is the sin that they've made. Jesus, this is the judgment for their sin. Jesus, you should get them. Every day I go to Georgia Tech and I hear about people who are bringing lawsuits to stop minority students from getting the quality education. First, they sue to stop us from race being considered in the application. Now you should know they're suing to stop us from giving scholarships to people based on race. It's bad enough you don't want me at the school, but once I get in the school, now you're trying to take away the financial resources I have to be in the school. And I don't know about you, but every time I hear about these people, I I become like the Pharisees. I wish I could grab them by the neck, drag them before Jesus and say, Jesus, get these evil people. You and I have an election coming up where Biden is going to sling mud at Trump and Trump is going to sling mud at Biden. And we know that neither man really cares about the plight of you and I in this country. What they really care about is getting back into the position because they enjoy being the president. You and I also know that if anyone in this sanctuary had done one-tenth of what President Trump is on trial for, we would not be at the trial. We would be under the jail. And all of us in here know no matter how this trial is going to work out, somehow one of his homeboys or his homegirls is simply going to pardon him as if the issue never happened in the first place. You and I get so mad if we could and the Secret Service wouldn't stop us. We want to drag Trump before Jesus just like that adulterous woman. And we want to say, Lord, you know he has sinned and the penalty for sin is death. Take him out, God. There are people in our families who have done all manner of evil. And if you can't think of anyone in your family who's done the manner of evil, then baby, it's you. You and I are so hurt and so angry at the people in our families who have done dastardly things to us that we would love to drag these jokers before Jesus. And we would love not even to wait for Jesus. Some of us in here have to be honest. I don't want to wait for Jesus. I want to throw the first stone. For every perpetrator of violence against innocent children, for every person of violence against senior citizens, you and I get so frustrated that we want to drag these people before Jesus and we would love to throw stones at them. I get frustrated when I think about the fact that my government has no problem sending hundreds of millions of my tax dollars to European nations that are in conflict, but they have never even lifted a finger to send a band-aid to Africa when they've got conflicts over there. And when I find out who's the person putting these bills, I would love to drag them before Jesus and get to throw it. Today, my brothers and sisters, you and I are not the poor woman who's been accused and accosted by a group of evil men. You and I are the evil men. We are the ones who hold people accountable to standards that we don't necessarily hold ourselves to. We are the ones who judge other people as if we are better than they are. We are the ones who cry out for judgment against other people. We are the ones who want Jesus to stone other people, but we never want Jesus to stone us. We are the ones who can think of all the things that should happen to somebody else, but Lord, offer me grace. 
Today, providence is not these jokers in the story. Today, it's us. When you and I have been wronged, when you and I have been hurt, when we have been mistreated, when we have been violated, you and I run to the moral high ground just like these Pharisees. We mentally and emotionally drag the violators of our lives into the town square before Jesus and we get ready to stone them. You see, the misery of this month of sermons during Black History Month, no less, is that if you really are serious about filling your spiritual bank account via this idea of debt eradication, then not only do you have to be thankful that Jesus eradicated your debts, then you have to not only be excited that Jesus absolved you of your sins, you have to not only shout that Jesus has forgiven you of your crimes, but if you are serious about filling your spiritual bank account, then you have to absolve the sins of other people. And if you don't want to, I don't blame you. But faith is not about how you feel. Faith has nothing to do about your feelings. What you want has nothing to do with it. Faith is about God, a God who forgave us long before you and I ever walked the earth, a God who gets in the business of forgiving people, people that don't deserve to be forgiven. He does it simply so that Christ could remind you that Christ needed first to set the tone in our lives and we must be compelled to follow the lead of Jesus, to make the point, to press the point, to illustrate the point. The biblical narrative from Genesis all the way to the maps is chocked full of so many stories about forgiveness. None, however, are as powerful as this story right here. The story is told like this. The Bible says that Jesus was at the Mount of Olives. He's teaching and leaving a little heaven behind every place that his holy feet shall tread. The people, the book says, came from miles around as he began to teach. And while he was trying to teach the lesson, the scribes and the Pharisees decided they were going to become the lesson. The Bible says they brought forth a woman caught in adultery and they said, I'm in verse four, Jesus or teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. Notice here, brothers and sisters, she wasn't accused of adultery. There wasn't a fuzzy videotape. We wondered, was it her who committed the adultery? There weren't two sides to the story. Maybe she didn't commit the adultery. They said she was caught in the act of adultery. I see the way you're looking at me. You don't understand what I'm saying. Let me make it clear. Are there any children here? She was caught in the act of adultery. In other words, she was making love. She was getting laid. She was rolling in the hay. She was doing the horizontal mamba. She was doing the funny business, shaking the sheets, getting lucky, knocking the boots, having relations, adult nap time, amorous congress, assault with a friendly weapon, being intimate, bumping uglies, doing the nasty, the wild thing. Have you got it yet? You didn't get it. She was doing the forbidden polka. She was doing the frickle frackle. She was messing around and bumping and grinding. Do you get the point? I don't think so. She was getting busy. She was getting down. She was getting it on. She was getting some. She was getting laid. She was going all the way. She was doing the hanky panky. She was having relations and my all time favorite Teddy P says she turned off the lights <laughs> and lit a candle. The Bible says she was caught in the act of adultery. This is the Bible's way of teaching you and I that she wasn't accused, that she was show enough guilty. And the reason why you and I can connect to this particular point in the story is because you and I have people like this in our lives. People who do not get the presumption of innocence because you and I know they are show enough guilty. You and I have people in our lives right now that we would love for Jesus to get them because we know they did it. We know they said it. We know they believed it. We know they tried it. They are guilty, guilty, guilty. And just like these Pharisees, we have mentally and emotionally done what these jokers did physically. We drag this person in our life. Surely Jesus wouldn't agree with this person. Surely Jesus wouldn't walk with this person. I'm so sick and tired of this joker. God, you have got to come and get them. I am right and they are wrong. You don't have any examples in your life, but I have examples in mine. I know a privileged Asian boy whose parents had plenty of money. Let conservatives use him to sue and keep privileged black children from going to college. And Jesus, you surely can't walk with this boy. I know a former president of the office of the United States. And 
an office that should have integrity with it. And this joke decided an insurrection, tried to overturn an election, uproot the country just so he could maintain power. Surely, Jesus, you can't walk with this one. I know a guy named Casey Goodman Jr., a black man in Columbus, Ohio, who was shot in the back by a police officer. The police officer originally lied and said that Casey was holding a gun. Only after the investigation was done did we find that the gun was actually in the kitchen with the safety on, no less. And then all of a sudden, the officer changed his story and seemingly he still was found not guilty. Surely, Jesus, you are picking up a stone for this one. And so in the text, while I indignantly drag these evil people in my life before Jesus, I rightfully declare, I'm in verse 5, that the law of Moses demands that we stone such people. People that do such evil, people that do such dastardly things, people that have treated us in certain ways, surely I should get to stone this person. I have the authority and the right to disrespect this person. I have the authority and the right to denounce this person. I have the authority and the right to denigrate this person. What they did was wrong. Get them, Jesus. Moses demands in the Old Testament that we stone such people. This is what the Pharisees said about the woman caught in adultery and if you go back in your Old Testament, the list of things you could get stoned for would blow your mind. Stone them, Jesus. Jesus, what do you say? Unlike the Pharisees, I'm not testing Jesus. I'm calling on Jesus. Jesus, I need you to show up in my life and enact my vengeance. Fulfill my anger. Assuage my tears. Throw the stones, Jesus. They were caught in the act, Jesus. They did the evil, Jesus. I know that they are guilty. Throw the stones, Jesus. And when Jesus bends down in the ground, I'm absolutely positively sure, I'm in verse 6, that he's bending down because he's picking up a stone and he's going to take these jokers out. I know that he's getting a stone. I know he's going to enact my vengeance. I know he's going to bring forth my anger. There are sinners that I have brought before you, Jesus. They don't act like me. They don't think like me. They don't do like I do. They are wrong, Jesus. I'm sick and tired of these people. They violated your law and your ways. They continue to do things that they think are appropriate. They are led by their flesh, and I'm tired of them, Jesus. I would put my hands on them myself, except your Bible says that they deserve to be stoned. Get him, Jesus. And when Jesus bends down, the Bible says he doesn't pick up a stone. Here you have someone who's clearly wrong, caught in the act of adultery. There's a corresponding law of Moses that clearly allows us to stone such a person. Jesus just writes with his finger in the sand. I can't let this go. I'm tired of this person. I've been dealing with this family member for 40 plus years in my life. I've been dealing with evil and tragedy for all these days. This person has not changed. They keep doing the things that they are doing. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm about to give them a piece of my mind. I'm about to put my hands on them. I'm about to lose my mind. Jesus, come on, Jesus. You know what I want, Jesus. Get the stone. Come on, Jesus. You know what I need, Jesus. Pick up the stones. Come on, Jesus. And then Jesus straightens up. He straightens up and instead of talking to them, he's talking to me. Wait a minute, Jesus. I'm not the one that took college admissions away from anybody. Why are you talking to me? I'm not working to make people a permanent underclass in this country. Why are you talking to me? I didn't invite an insurrection in this country. I didn't try to steal a vote. I have not shot any unarmed person. I didn't lie about my behavior. Why, Jesus, are you talking to me? I didn't do what they did. I didn't behave like they behaved. I didn't act like they acted. God, why in the world are you standing up talking to me? I feel in this moment like the Pharisees feel in this text. I wasn't the one caught in adultery. She was the one caught in adultery. She was the one who violated the law. She was the one who did wrong. Why in the world, Jesus, won't you just follow what the law says and stone her? Why are you talking to me? I'm tired of being the Christian. I'm tired of forgiving people. I'm tired of loving my neighbor. I'm tired of letting these Negroes off the hook. Lord, why are you talking to me? Jesus speaks to you and I. In the text, he says, Providence you are well within your right to stone them. 
And if you would like to stone them, go ahead. One caveat, though. Let any among you who are without sin be the first one to throw a stone. Yes, I can. Wait, um, wait. Wait. I was going to throw the stone, but you told me anyone who's without sin can be the first one to throw a stone. Jesus, I, I, I didn't say I was out without sin. I just said I didn't do their sin. I didn't ask, Jesus responds, about the way that you process sin. Because the way that you as a human processes sin is not the way I've taught you to in your Bible. I said anyone who commits these sins should be stoned. I'm agreeing with Moses. My only stipulation is you can't pick up a stone unless you are sinless. Otherwise, then you have to be stoned too. Immediately, my, my mind is racing, but my heart is dejected. All my anger is for nothing because I know that I'm a sinner too. I've never sued to take away anyone else's access. But I have in my life been so selfish that I've made decisions that have injured other people. I never caused an insurrection or tried to steal a vote. But I have in my life made decisions that have hurt other people so I could maintain some status that I thought I had. I've never shot an unarmed person with a gun. But I have shot offensive looks and offensive words and offensive hands on the children of God. Let you who is without sin cast the first stone. The Bible says when the Pharisees heard it, they went away. They backed down. They backed off. Because you can only maintain the moral high ground when you are not challenged to consider your own sin. In the moment that you consider your sin in the same context as someone else's sin, you have to forgive. Because you have been forgiven. The Pharisees had to walk away. Jesus' point about being without sin to cast the first stone was so apropos. My flesh wants some people to be stoned so that they can feel as bad as I feel about what they've done. My spirit says I understand. But Jesus forgave you when you were the sinner. And how can you dare throw a stone at someone else when the Lord our God never threw a stone at you? Amen. Now, if God isn't throwing stones at me, and when I'm not around good church folks, I know how many stones I deserve. When it's not Sunday with a suit on, when I don't have on a nice dress and makeup, when I haven't come in the sanctuary with the mask of my Christianity on, and I know how many stones I deserve, I realize that Jesus has treated me just like this woman in the text. In my life, I've been caught in the act and forgiven on the spot. And the only way I can dare acknowledge that I understand this is not because I come in the church on Sunday morning and it's not because I shout and scream and it's not because I lift up holy hands but if you are going to prove it to me God says that you really understand how much I have wiped your slate clean if you really understand how much I have forgiven you if you really understand the fact that I caught you in the middle of the act yet I forgave you on the spot if you get it then do it somebody else. God bless you, Providence.